It's one of the most amazing experiences two people can go through. Hello, this is so For the next year, our cameras will be following 100 couples all over the UK as they try for a baby. Forget careers, forget everything else. The one thing that you can do with your life that is truly amazing is have a child. On this astonishing journey, we'll be separating fact from fiction and examining some of those old wives' tales. I've heard that an orgasm is important in trying to conceive a baby. Cough mixture. Yeah. You should have cough mixture. Drink ginger and obviously use ginger in my cooking as well. We'll be there for the moments of joy. One little person bouncing up and down. Oh, and again, it's jumping. No way. And moments of sadness. She turned around and says, I'm so sorry, but we can't see a heartbeat. So, devastated. To kick off the series, we've brought 100 couples together. They've all been trying to conceive for at least one month, and some will already be pregnant. At the end of the programme, they, and we, will find out who's already expecting on Make Me A Baby. Ask anyone who's been through it, and they'll tell you that having a baby can be an experience full of joy, excitement, and sometimes even sadness. Each of our 100 couples are bound to go through a whole range of emotions over the next year as they try to make a baby. And we'll be examining the factors that will affect their chances of conceiving. From weight to what they do in the bedroom. There's times I've had to wake him up and say, right, it's time, you've got to do it tonight. I feel very much like a piece of me, especially when I'm waking up and there's something there on top of me thinking, Oh, OK. I'm a swinging for a chandelier type of guy, you know. Coming up, we'll see what works. Wham, bam. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, do, do what you've got to do. What doesn't work. If you do it within the full moon or either side of it, you get a girl. And what's just plain weird. Lying in bed with your legs in the air, cycling your legs for 20 minutes, which is actually really good exercise. We've also assembled a team of the country's top fertility experts. Dr Cecilia Piper has been studying conception and the factors that affect female fertility for over 15 years. Dr Alan Pacey is our specialist in sperm. When it comes to sperm, he's the man. And Zeta West is pregnancy and fertility guru to the stars. Davina McCall and Kate Winslet have gone to her for advice, and so will we. And I'm Dr Simon Atkins. As a GP, every week I meet couples who are pursuing parenthood. One of the things we always check in pregnancy is blood pressure, so if we can get the ball rolling today and I'll check that for you. Our three experts and I will be on hand as our couples try to conceive and as some go through pregnancy. You spent half your life trying not to get pregnant and you're not really interested in the, in the biology at that time. It's only like so many women sit here and say, God, I knew nothing about my cycle. I had no idea what was going on in my body because I wasn't remotely interested up until you know this point that I'm now trying. But our couples have made the decision to try to make a baby. And through the course of the series, we're going to learn about the factors which affect their fertility and how quickly they may get pregnant. When a couple plan to conceive, it's a really important time in their lives. And they find it both rewarding emotionally and it can be very meaningful. It can also be a very distressing and difficult time, especially when they don't conceive. Our 100 couples are a representative sample of the hundreds of thousands in the UK trying to get pregnant. And that means they can give us an insight into baby making in the 21st century. Today's woman wants a you know, quick fix, wakes up, I want a baby and I want it now. And you know, we're, we're used to having so much control over our lives, this is the one thing that eludes you. You know, when women are trying for a baby and the whole fertility thing, the common sense has gone. And I sit here and I do biology lessons day after day. You know, the egg is fertilizable for 12 to 24 hours. The sperm lasts three to five days. You need enough sperm up there ready to pounce on the egg when it comes out. Very basic. One of the most common worries is that if sperm leaks out after sex, you might not get pregnant. After we have sex and orgasm, perhaps you'll prop a pillow 
a two yeah. underneath her bum and sit there for half an hour, 20 minutes. I also Something lie there like... for about half an hour with my legs in the air afterwards. <laughs> well, my sister's idea was to ha actually have sex that way. And um, <laughs> we did try it. We, we, did, we, we gave it a shot, you know. It doesn't matter what position you're doing it in. I think the only thing that's important is that you're keeping as much semen in at the end afterwards as possible. I stay still as I can <laughs> most of the night and then check for fallout the next morning. He sometimes picks me up by the legs, <laughs> kind of thing. One of the questions I get asked quite a lot, especially by women, is that they have this fear that when they've had sex and they stand up that all the sperm, you know, comes out and they say, oh my God, I'm losing the sperm, you know, it's not staying up there. That's why they do handstands and put their feet in the air, etc. And that's, you know, normal flow back, which is completely natural and not damaging to fertility. And I think that they feel very relieved when they've asked the question because they feel embarrassed to ask it and it's something they can't ask their, their doctors. But it's not just women who have some odd ideas about fertility. Men do too. Sperm specialist, Dr. Alan Pacey, has come across some corkers. The most unusual thing that's ever happened here, I think, is when a, a chap sent in his pants through the post for us to analyse to see whether or not he was fertile. We can't do that. We need a freshly produced fluid sample. Lots of men think storing up sperm will make them more potent. But is that really true? I do abstain a couple of days before we know that Faisal are most fertile, yeah. just to give it the build up. My partner's storing. He's creating some super sperm for three weeks. <laughs> it's a myth that not ejaculating and saving sperm makes them better. When there are many, many sperm inside the male reproductive tract and they're there for a long time, sperm begin to die. Dying sperm injure others. It's a bit like being on a crowded train. Everyone, after a while, gets very ill and are affected by the other passengers around them. So we think that regular ejaculation every two or three days actually keeps the sperm in the male reproductive tract at its most optimum. The experts may advise ejaculation at regular intervals, but remember, sex isn't just about baby making. You have to be careful that the pressure of trying to become pregnant doesn't take all the fun out of having sex. How has baby making sex affected the love lives of our couples? Are they still enjoying it or has it all become a bit of a grind? Women become very obsessed with temperature charts, ovulation sticks, but also telling their men every little minute detail about what's going on in their body. And men don't often want to hear it. And what starts to happen is that woman around ovulation gets really obsessed, drags her man back from work. A man has to have desire to have sex. He's been dragged back from the office and told exactly when he has to do it. It goes out of the window, it just doesn't happen. We used to have fun sex, 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 quick sex, making love as well, you know, sex would be full of love. Now it's a chore to me. Tedious. Mechanical. It is, yeah, very mechanical. We've got, you've got it down to five minutes now, haven't yeah. you? Yeah, exactly. Including getting the Guinness Book of Records. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, five minutes and that includes him getting up and making a cup of tea at the end. <laughs> I just sometimes wish it wasn't so pressured. I sometimes wish it yeah. could, you, that you could get pregnant at any time of the month so it didn't have to feel as if you were, because I do feel like I'm pushing him sometimes and... Well, my Victorian values is <laughs> what else do you have sex for anyway? <laughs> Michael's a professional photographer based in Glasgow. He's been married to Patsy for six months, but they've been together for seven years. They're serious party people, and they've been trying for a baby for over a year. A baby to us is the ultimate gift. It's what we want, it's what we're striving for. Patsy works in a tattoo parlour as a receptionist and body piercer. If you could grab that clamp, Tim. Patsy's 35, and she put off having a family until she knew she was with the right man. But now she's ready. Since I've been with Michael, it's not something I've wanted my whole life, but I think that's down to your body clock. I spent so much of my time, you know, my job, my job, my job, and now that it's got to that certain stage, I'm like, right, OK, time for something else, and it's really what I want. It's, it's become more and more important, and now it's now it feels like we're just waiting. It's like waiting for the postman to deliver a letter, and he's just got the wrong address. <laughs> Michael says trying for a baby has forced him to look at the way he lives. 
It's strange because you spend a portion of your life, your, your younger age, sort of try to avoid these situations, try to avoid getting pregnant. That's what I was and, and, and now we're running about trying to get pregnant. And <laughs> to, 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 to like young people, like to teenagers and stuff, it must look really it silly, you know? Silly. Yeah. <laughs> Patsy and Michael are doing everything they can to conceive. The pressure is starting to affect their relationship. It gets to the point, because it is a sensitive issue, no matter how close you are as a couple, it gets to a point where, in your head, you're like, was it me? Is it him? Is it... And not a blame or anything else, but you, you kind of have a bit of a divide because of that. And the longer it takes, the more, unless you bridge it pretty quickly, that divide becomes bigger and bigger, and you become a sperm donor and a womb. Patsy and Michael are also experimenting in the bedroom <laughs> to try to get that positive result. We've taken to, after I ejaculate, I'd go down and um, <laughs> give Patsy oral sex to keep the sperm in, basically, yeah. Sorry, Mum. Yeah, but <laughs> we're doing that, aren't we? Sorry, and Mum. A couple of new positions, so we're just a... <laughs> no matter how old you are, you don't want your mother to hear that, do you? <laughs> the bad news is that not only is Patsy now very embarrassed, but at 35, her body clock is ticking. It's a modern phenomenon that couples are putting off starting a family until later and later. Male fertility does decline with age, but the years are much tougher on women. So we've divided the women in our study into under 25s, under 35s, and 35 plus. Research from IVF studies has shown that female fertility starts declining slightly after 30, and more dramatically after 35. In fact, about one-third of women between 35 and 39 have fertility problems, and two-thirds of women over 40. This is because, as a woman gets older, her reproductive system deteriorates. Well, what we know is the ovum is not as healthy, and therefore, even when it does get fertilised, it's more vulnerable. What we know is that it's not necessarily as efficient as at implanting into the womb, and therefore that can result in a very early miscarriage. What we also know is they're more likely to have genetic defects and therefore even if the baby grows for a while, they might have a miscarriage. There is another factor that can mean older women are less likely to conceive. Surprisingly, one of the things I find through seeing women through my clinic is that older women are having less sex and you need sex to have a baby. How old are you? I'm 41. And do you have children already? I don't. I'm sure you're aware that the older you get, the less fertile you're supposed to be. Have you been taking any steps to try and compensate for that at all? Yes, I have. I've been taking a lot of uh, multivitamins and I'm eating well. You're yes. just generally looking after yourself? Yeah. Now, you're not quite in the golden oldie group, but how does it feel to be one of the oldest women here? Well, actually, I, I feel a bit angry with myself that I've, I'm at this place in my life where I'm 36 trying to conceive our second child. Because at 34, I conceived easily, had a healthy baby. And now, here we find ourselves trying to conceive for 12 months. I feel that my eggs have gone off. <laughs> How old's your other half? He's exactly my age. He's two hours older than I am. All right. But we're pressing on. Well, I wish you all the best with it. Good luck. Thanks. Hope it goes well. If couples delay starting a family until into their 30s, it cuts down the time they have to deal with any problems should they occur. But it's a tough call deciding when the right time to start a family actually is especially when you're already juggling career and social life. This is Paul and Juliet. They live in Newcastle under Lyme, but met over 10 years ago at a fantasy role-playing weekend. In the past, all their spare time was spent either on their hobby or at work, and that means they've delayed starting a family. But now they've decided they don't want to wait any longer. We want to have a baby because it's, it, it, it's the sum of the two of us, effectively. It's the summation of our relationship together. My mum said something very important to me when I was younger. She said, you know, your careers and everything is great and you've really got to do that. She says, well, you can't miss out on one of the most amazing things in life. She says, it's like you can have travel the world, have great loads of money, but actually having a child is just truly an amazing, astounding thing that you, you just, it's, it would seem such a waste to miss out on such an amazing thing in life. Hello. Juliet is 29 and runs her own internet business. She's constantly on call, something she finds adds to the pressure of an already stressful job. Are you at your computer now? Although I try very hard to keep it office hours because otherwise you'd just go completely crazy. 
if one of the servers fails, for example, then it's three in the morning, it doesn't care, the computer doesn't care what time of day it is, you've got to deal with it because your customers are completely reliant on it. Although Juliet is only in her early 30s, she knows her body clock is ticking and she wants to give herself plenty of time to get pregnant. Paul's quite old, a lot older than me and I didn't want to, you know, I wouldn't want to be old with the parents and, you know, I wouldn't want to leave it to the point where, you know, if any difficulties did occur, there's not enough time to fix it. You know, if you leave it till you're 35, then realise you've got problems, well, you're really counting down the time you've got to kind of fix them or, or resolve them. So I, it got to the point where I thought, well, we really should start to try now. Juliet's worried about leaving baby making until she's too old. But she has to know it's not just the age of the woman that's important. As a man gets older, sperm quality declines and DNA in sperm fragments. As a man gets older, he's less likely to get his partner pregnant. It ticks less loudly than the female biological clock, but I think it's there nevertheless. There's one thing you have to do to get pregnant naturally, and that's have sex. Making love, bonking, baby making, whatever you want to call it, you have to do it often enough to give yourself a good chance of conceiving. Couples in the UK have sex on average 10 times a month. But what about our couples here? This is how often our couples have sex. I'm going to find out why some people are hardly having any sex at all, and others seem to be doing little else. How often would you say that you had sex every month? Is that with or without foreplay? <laughs> you tell me. It's always without. <laughs> I would say first thing about maybe once a week. But we're not getting too involved in the whole charting and right this okay. this time of the month and we have to do it then and Pete get home this minute. I can't wait for that. <laughs> Jane and Simon, you're in the um, four times a month all less group. Is is there a plan behind that? Um, yeah, there is. We've got two small children already, two little girls, and when we tried for those, I decided that the best thing to do was go for day 13, 14 and 15. So we had sex on just those three days, and luckily, both times with both the girls, it worked. Right. So we thought, we've found a winning formula, let's try it again. Right. And, and do you find, you know, only doing it that many times a month is a strain on your relationship, or do, or do you sort of break the rules sometimes? Well, it's sometimes? a strain for James, it's too many. Yeah. <laughs> I'm perfectly happy with that. I can organise my life around those three days absolutely fine. The window of opportunity. There might be a random one as well. It's not just, you know... If he gets lucky. You never know. You never know your lord. Sex is vital to have a baby, and you can run down every route you like, but if you're not having sex, you're not going to get pregnant. If you're having sex once a month, on average it's going to take you 43 months to conceive. If you're having sex more than 15 times a month, it's going to take you three and a half months to conceive. Now, I know these figures are based on an age group of 20 to 30, but, you know, getting that across to them is very, very important. Really rev up the amount of times that you're, you're having sex. Simon and Jane from Derby have been trying to get pregnant for two months. Simon is a self-employed builder and his wife Jane works for him. They've already got two girls, four-year-old Zara and five-year-old Eloise. But Jane and Simon have a problem. Simon has started building an extension and has turned their house into a building site. The couple's bedroom is in such a state, Jane's now refusing to sleep in the same bed as Simon. It was just too cold. All the tarpaulings flapping in the wind. Then I perfect and the silence. Gale blowing, dark, so. freezing cold gale blowing in. And all the time that I was laid You're here. You're a bit fussy though, you've got to be perfect. Oh. My extremities were just freezing. I thought I'd got frostbite. There was no way. I mean, it's all right for Simon. His side of the bed, he's got the radiator. Yeah, we swapped over there, didn't we? Okay. And what did you say the morning after? I said it is a bit cold in here, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> because of the building work going on, Jane and Simon not only sleep in separate beds, they sleep on separate floors, literally. Okay. I mean, that's it. We've got the quilts in the hallway. They get thrown mm -hmm. on there. You're spoiled, aren't you? Oh, I am entirely. But the only problem is the girls actually love to bounce on this. When they get home from nursery and school, they just think it's fantastic and it's developed a slow puncture. It's fine when I first go to bed, but during the, the night, mm -hmm. it goes down slowly. So in the morning, I'm completely deflated, just like my mattress. Jane and the mattress aren't the only ones who are deflated. This arrangement is playing havoc with the couple's sex life. We'll give it a quick bash on the old blow-up bed before Simon goes upstairs. <laughs> But despite their problems, Jane and Simon do have a plan. 
They're targeting the days they do manage to have sex to 13, 14 and 15 of Jane's cycle. Based on a 28-day cycle, these dates are the day before, the day of and the day after Jane's ovulation. And as well as that plan, occasionally the stress of the building work actually helps their sex life. We have had the odd row and I've walked out in tears and we may have ended up having sex on the back of that. Jane and Simon might be struggling to fit sex into their lifestyle, but for some, it's the other way round. I understand you have quite sex quite often. Sometimes, three times per day. Wow. Oh, yeah. Seven days a week. Do you ever get any rest? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> when she's at work. <laughs> <laughs> it's good for you as well, is it? Well, yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, I got no complaints. Well, it's good to know that she's more than satisfied with her sex life, but that's not always the case. How important is it for a woman to have an orgasm when a couple are trying to conceive? Um, I've heard, actually, that it's very useful for a woman to climax. I think it's before her partner. It kind of sucks the sperm in. But we can't make that happen. I like to um, have an orgasm just for the fun of it and not just for a baby. I'll try to have one. <laughs> The good news is that although orgasm can be helpful to conception, it's not essential. The sperm are propelled along by the lining of the uterus anyway. But that poor little sperm can come across some hazards on the way to fertilising the egg. One of the biggest obstacles in its path can be lubricants. Uh, we do use lubricants, yes. Yeah. Buckets of the stuff sitting by the bed, you know. Started reading erotic books before you know, we think about having yeah. sex. So if things aren't quite as romantic as they might be then. It does certainly come in handy for that. And you don't need lubrication, <laughs> and we've got quite a lot of natural stuff going on. There's certainly data from research studies that show that the use of lubricants such as olive oil, believe it or not, or even water-based lubricants such as KY jelly or Astroglide, or even saliva used as a lubricant, can actually have quite a bad effect on the movement of sperm. There was a good laboratory study done a few years ago, and they found, I think quite surprisingly, that saliva was able to kill sperm at actually quite low concentrations. So theoretically, at least, that means that anybody who may use saliva as a lubricant or perhaps engage in oral sex prior to intercourse could be doing more harm than good. Even if sperm are not battling lubricants and saliva, the start of the race to the fallopian tubes is full of obstacles. Every woman has cells that secrete a very fine mucus or secretion and according to what the hormone level is, sometimes the secretions are quite thick and sticky and the sperm can't get through them. But as the woman gets more fertile, the oestrogen levels go up and then they change from being thick and sticky to being clear and stretchy. And they look like the uncooked egg white. And if you look at them under a microscope, they look like swimming channels. And you can see the sperm are swimming in these channels through the cervix and up to the uterus. Of course, the sperm only encounters all that mucus once it's in the right place. How do some of our 100 couples go about getting it there? How important is sexual position? The plain, older... The old missionary job. Yeah. <laughs> kind of boring. The most boring position is the only one. Missionary. 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 Strictly missionary. Quite mechanical, isn't it? Who would have thought bonking could become boring? But baby making doesn't have to be missionary. As long as you're having penetration, any position is fine. Obviously the key thing is to have enough sex. Two to three times a week is fine. Any more can be stressful and sex shouldn't become a chore. Whether it's been a chore or not, all of our 100 couples have been trying to get pregnant for the last month. They'll soon be finding out who has managed to get pregnant already. I do find it nerve-wracking doing pregnancy tests. It is quite nerve-wracking. Every time I do a pregnancy test, it's my heart literally really does break into when I'm not. But before we find out which of our 100 couples are pregnant, we're getting all the men to produce a sperm sample so we can measure their sperm counts. Dr Pacey and his team are going to have a busy weekend. I want you to produce a sample of semen into one of these pots. And I want you to do that by a process called masturbation. I'm sure it will come as no difficulty to you at all. It's a wide mouth container. I'm sure some of you guys are going to be happy about that. There's lots to aim at, but it may become all a bit of a mad panic at the end. So if you spill a bit 
we need to know because it makes a difference with the analysis. All right, let's go through. Before the sample is produced, there's one last vital instruction. Make sure you lock the door. Oh, we'll do. There you go. See you later. Obviously, uh, if it is low, I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect it to be, but if it is, and maybe, maybe look at a change in diet, maybe change in activity and fitness, that kind of thing, see what can be done. I would be gutted if it were low. Absolutely gutted, yeah. I just wouldn't feel like a red-blooded male, I suppose, you know what I mean? Out of all of our 100 couples, there's one man who knows more than most about giving a sperm sample. This is Sam and Chris from Portsmouth. Chris is 52 and Sam is 29. There's a 23 year age gap between us. It was a little bit hard for me to get my head round, wasn't it? To start with, wasn't it? To start it? with, I was sort of telling Chris that I couldn't get with him because of the age gap and stuff like that. Um, but then, you know, you just fall in love and love knows no age and that was that. Couldn't leave. Right. <laughs> in fact, the couple feel that the age gap has brought them closer together. We're, we are very we close. Are very close. Yeah, inseparable. I think you're one of the few people that actually think like me and stuff. Can't stand being Soulmates. away from each other at all. The couple have been together for nine years and have been trying for a baby for six months. Chris already has a son and two daughters in their 20s. Sam has two teenage girls, Katie and Jade. I had my first daughter 14 years ago. Um, I was 15 at the time, quite young. Then went on to have my second one, uh, another mistake, um, wasn't planned or anything. Just um, came really easy. Just came really easy, yeah. Um, so I suppose that's part of the reason why I'm so worried about it now. But happiness with Chris has made Sam determined to have another baby. I decided that I wanted a baby because my family is not complete yet. I mean, I know I've got the two girls and, and that, but I'm not with their dad anymore and it I'm with a new partner and it seems that a baby would complete our family. Chris had a vasectomy 14 years ago, but when he and Sam decided to have a family, they paid for an operation to have it reversed. Ever since then, they've been putting all their efforts into trying to conceive. I can't remember the last time I had sex without having baby, baby, baby on my mind. No. Obviously, before the vasectomy before reversal. Before the vasectomy reversal, yeah, but yeah. not since, eh? No. No, it is, we do it just purely, Definitely. just got the hat making a baby in mind. They had hoped they would get pregnant quickly after the operation, but six months later, they still haven't conceived, and the couple are starting to feel the pressure. People are just so cruel and definitely unsympathetic towards us because he had a vasectomy. He'd done what was right at that time in his life and now it's not right and we just can't seem to get anybody that understands especially anyone in the medical profession the greater the time between the vasectomy and having a reversal the less likely you are to conceive sam and chris both think the reversal hasn't worked and needs to be redone the couple have found a clinic in the united states that specializes in reversal operations if i do need a redo then i am going to arizona we won't get it, it done in england not again get it done in england again definitely going to go to arizona chris has been investigating how they do the reversal they do things like once they've got you open and they've opened up the ends of the tubes they will actually milk the man to see what's in his tubes even if he's been resectomized for 20 years there's still in, that, in the bottom end of the tube, there is still, you're still producing your semen and it should still be present. They'll take that away and analyse that on the spot. But it's a big step. A private operation in America doesn't come cheap. It's going to cost around about seven to eight thousand pound. I mean, they are far more expensive than, than the, a lot of the English clinics, but I think it's well worth it. In the meantime, Sam and Chris are closely monitoring the situation. Should we do a sample? Yes, all right, Helen. Go on then. <laughs> OK. See you in a bit. See you in a bit. Sam and Chris are so determined to get pregnant, they've brought their own microscope and have started checking Chris's sperm count. I don't know anywhere around here where I can actually pay to have a sperm test, so you rely on the National Health mm. Sperm Test and you can only have one every six months and that's just not good enough. I want to know what it's like now. I can't be bothered waiting for someone else to yeah. test my sperm when I can do it myself. That's well busy. <laughs> The whole process has meant Sam and Chris have become DIY sperm count experts.
the first sperm count I did myself after the reversal, I could count maybe six sperm swimming around. There was quite a lot of dead ones lying around, but only about six swimming. Whereas this is just absolutely teeming with life. Absolutely dozens of them. And this is all you're really looking at in here is one pinprick. This is definitely one of the best I've seen. Well done, honey. No. <laughs> Back in our lab, Dr. Pacey and his team are also calculating sperm counts. To do this, the sperm in each sample are killed and then placed under a grid. The number of sperm in each square are then recorded and the overall count is calculated from that. One in six couples in the United Kingdom have a fertility problem at some point in their lives, that is true. And what's interesting from my point of view is that in about 30% of those cases, that will almost certainly be down to a problem with the male partner. It's fair to say that a man's sperm count is a hugely personal and emotive topic, but some men may be damaging their sperm and they don't even know it. Tight underpants can heat the male reproductive system and damage sperm. That is true. It's controversial, but I think it's true because there's increasing evidence that men who wear tight pants or who have jobs where they sit down a lot can actually heat the male reproductive system too much and can potentially damage the production of sperm. And speaking of the production of sperm, they may deny it, but most men do masturbate. In general, I don't masturbate anyway. Not a big, uh, a big wanker, <laughs> if you like. I wish I had that amount of spare energy. If I you know, masturbate a lot prior to us having or trying to make a baby and then we try, it's, I'm lessening the chances. But if blokes give themselves a bit of a hand, does it help or hinder trying to conceive? Ejaculation too frequently depletes the sperm store and it takes two or three months to produce sperm so sperm production might not be able to keep up. For all our worried would-be dads, the bottom line is that for best results, men shouldn't masturbate for about two or three days before baby making. Basically, keep your hands off. Back in our lab, once the sample is produced, Dr Pacey has a few questions before the sperm is analysed. Could I ask you when you last ejaculated before today? Um, before today, um, it would have been about a week ago. About a week ago, so I've got seven days for that. Dr Pacey can now hand over the sperm for analysis. It's going to be a nervous wait for our men. To recover from the stress of producing a sperm sample, some of our couples have retired to a bar to unwind. But some ways of unwinding can cause problems themselves. I will sacrifice I'm not a lot. a heavy drinker, but no. if we had problems conceiving, that'd be the one thing that you'd yeah. have to give up. Stop drinking. <laughs> okay, stop drinking <laughs> as much. They're not always that. They're over there. So which of our 100 couples have the most potentially damaging lifestyles? To illustrate how much our couples drink and smoke, we're awarding them empty bottles and boxes. One bottle is roughly three glasses of wine or lager a week. They get a box for every five cigarettes they smoke per day. One of the questions I'm asked frequently is, is there anything I can do to improve the quality of my eggs? Um, and is there anything that he can do to improve the quality of sperm? And I think that's where lifestyle factors come in. Alcohol, cigarettes, diet, nutrition, stress. I mean, a woman is born with all the eggs she's ever, ever going to possess. She'll never have any more. And I do think that the environment that those eggs are in is important. A man is manufacturing sperm 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And lifestyle factors do have a huge impact on sperm. So, time to find out which of our couple's lifestyles are more Keith Richards than Cliff Richard. The group on the left have few bad habits. The middle group take a drink or the occasional fag, but don't have too much to worry about. Whereas the group on the right, well, let's just say they know how to party. You look like you're having trouble holding your drink there, Barbara. That's uh, yeah. quite a fair few bottles. I'm quite shocked, actually, about the amount that I actually drink. So what does that translate into, that, that number that you've got there? Probably about three quarters of a bottle a night. Is that just you, or you, you share it? No, that's, that's just that's Barbara. That's just me. Yeah. Really? <laughs> 
Barbara and Andy live in Nottingham. They already have three-year-old Josh, but have been trying for a second child now for two months. It was very important for me to have a family um, because I was adopted as a baby and also being an only child, I wanted to have more than one child myself. Trying for a baby has put pressure on their relationship and on Andy's relationship with football. Andy is a referee and manages a team, which means he's out at least four nights a week. Well, at dinner time, Andy doesn't come home from work, so he finishes work at five and then goes straight to football. Barbara and Andy's relationship is suffering. When Andy's out at his beloved football, Barbara has developed a worrying habit. An average night for me is usually after I've put Josh to bed, get the telly on, get the wine open. I do know that she you know, has quite a little bit to drink at home. Um, I don't really begrudge her for it because, like I say, she's sitting at home on her own. If I have a drink in the evening, then it sends me to sleep. Um, so, unfortunately, when Andy does get in at quarter to 11, there's absolutely no chance of having any baby making on the agenda because I'll be asleep. The extra money Andy gets for refereeing is a big help to the couple, but is it a price worth paying? I always feel like a single parent. I think everyone thinks I'm a single parent because I, I go to toddler groups or I go to play centres and see the same people there, see the same families, and sometimes I feel a bit resentful. I do feel sort of guilty really being out of the home because um, I know Barbara just, you know, with a full-time job, she is tough for her. Although Barbara reckons she doesn't have a serious problem with alcohol, she's not happy with her situation. I think it's unacceptable that I'm having so much to drink but I think it's unacceptable as well that I am left on my own a lot because we are meant to be a family. We're still learning about the problems with alcohol and the thoughts are that maybe a few units don't matter that much but any large amount can cause fetal abnormalities. So the good news is that you really have to do drink an awful lot and I mean be a chronic alcoholic before your ability to produce sperm is affected. But of course even social drinking can affect your ability to have an erection and if you're trying for a baby that really is bad news. Alcohol consumption causes blood sugar to fluctuate widely. This can have an effect on hormonal imbalance which affects fertility. But it's not just alcohol that some of our couples have to cut back on. Rachel and Mark, that's a fair few cigarettes you've got there between you. It is, yeah. <laughs> so how many do you get through a day each then, do you think? Well... I go through 20 a day. Yeah, I'm on about 15 a day. And has this made you think about your smoking, seeing how many you've got there in front of you? Um, there won't be no more smoking after today. Really? <laughs> yeah, that's, seriously. Yeah. That's been enough It's to... a shock. It's upset me to see that this is all that we smoke and it's far too much. I notice you haven't got any bottles of wine. Is that because you don't drink quite enough to qualify for one. Um, I'm an ex-alcoholic really so I don't drink anymore. Thanks to Paula. She saved me from that really. Fantastic. So now <laughs> you've got to help each other with that one. Keep nagging at him to give up and I think after this he might. And what about you? I'm desperate to give up yeah. but it's hard if, if he still carries on smoking. Paula and Gary are from Halstead in Essex and they've been trying to get pregnant for four months. Paula has a son and Gary a daughter from previous relationships. Gary went through 20 years of alcoholism before he met Paula. He knows he made mistakes first time round. Having drink problems uh, in the past, basically I wasn't a very good dad to be honest with you anyway. I was out working or if I wasn't working I was drinking. I've kicked a drink on the head anyway. I'm just hoping things will run smoothly. Paula knows she also made mistakes with her son Tyler. Put too much emphasis on materialistic things and didn't spend enough time enjoying what I had. We're very close now, but the only thing I won't change is the fact that twice a day, every day, I tell my son I love you and he says it back to me. Both Paula and Gary have smoked since their teens. Paula wasn't able to give up during her last pregnancy. I think I was still smoking about 15 maybe more proper cigarettes a day when I was preg pregnant the first time. Tyler had pneumonia as a baby and still has breathing problems. I always think, was that caused by me smoking? And you start off with all the intentions when you have a baby. I won't smoke in the house, I won't smoke near my baby. And slowly it, you lose all those good intentions and you go for whatever's easiest in life. But I definitely think I would change that. Paula was able to help Gary stop drinking. Now they both have to tackle their smoking habit 
for the sake of their own health and their possible family to be. I've seen Gaz with, interact with other children, I've seen him with my son. I know that he can see things from a child's point of view, he's very good and I think he'll make, he'll make a great dad this time round. Paula and Gary are doing their best to kick the habit and if they succeed, it's a scientific fact it will improve their chances of conceiving. Smoking reduces the oxygen intake and that compromises the body. It causes an earlier menopause which can be a real problem for women and what we do know with many, many studies is that smoking reduces the rate at which women get pregnant. The ability to produce sperm isn't affected by smoking, but smoking does damage the quality of sperm. Since it takes three months to produce a sperm, any change in your lifestyle, such as giving up smoking, needs to be planned well in advance. Back in the lab, Dr Pacey has almost finished the analysis of our 100 sperm samples. An average count is between 20 and 50 million sperm per milliliter. We have one or two men here who have very low sperm counts of one million sperm per mil or less. But the lab record today is one chap who has 408 million sperm per mil. That sounds phenomenal. If I had a sperm count like that, I'd want everyone to know about it. Is, is there any way you can tell just by looking? Are there any features that show that? There's nothing obvious, but there is a piece of research that suggests the clue might be in your right hand. Can I, can I have your hand? Yeah. It's the ratio between that finger and that finger, which can be broadly correlated to sperm count. The key is that finger is generally longer in men who have higher sperm counts. So what's the mechanism of that? It's the same genes that encode for the development of the finger ratios that also trigger development of the testicles. So how am I doing? Well, it says you're, you're all right, but <laughs> I don't think you're going to break any records. But measuring sperm counts is a much better guide to high fertility than having a longer ring finger than index finger. Dr Pacey's results will soon be ready. Oh, that's a nice sample. Some factors that affect fertility are not under our control. But there's one key fertility factor that can be changed, provided you have the willpower. And that's your body mass index. Body mass index, or BMI, is a scale that looks at a ratio between your weight and height. It calculates how much of your weight is made up of fat, rather than bone, muscle and organs. If we do conceive, I wouldn't be surprised if Louise actually gave birth to a tub of heart pack. The amount of fat that I eat is untrue. My diet is appalling. Shocking. Absolutely shocking. Chips and gravy every night do me fat. Oh, wishing butters. Your body mass index only needs to be 10% away from the norm for your fertility to be affected. The surprising thing is that being underweight can be just as damaging to fertility as being obese. I've asked him so many times to have a bowl of cereal or some toast or something for breakfast and drink more water and just be generally more healthy. But That's fine, but you can't fry cereal, so <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Extreme BMI scores have a much more direct effect on the fertility of women, so it's only the women from our 100 couples that we've asked to line up against our BMI index. A normal BMI is between 19 and 24. The group on the left are below that, and a BMI that's too low is as bad as one that's too high. Jackie, you're in the lowest BMI group. Is this a size that you've always been? Yeah, yeah it is. Uh -huh. So it's not something you've, you've dieted for and exercised for to try and get that way. It's a, no, a build not. you've this always had. <laughs> yeah. That's you, is it? Yes. Do you eat normal diet and things? Um, lots of sweets and chocolate. and wow. Not really crisps, but sweets and chocolate. Rachel, you're obviously very tall, oh, yeah. so to have a low BMI, you can't weigh very much. What, what do you weigh? Uh, I'm eight stone nine at the moment. Wow, and is that a weight you've always been, or is it something you've worked at? No, I've always been thin. I've never, I've never really had any weight to me, and I do find it a struggle to put weight on. And have you got any children at all? I have no children at the moment, no, but we have been trying for 12 months. You've been thinking about sort of trying to feed yourself even, even more? Yeah, I think there's only so much I can eat, though, and <laughs> I do eat to, uh, till I'm full, so it's, uh, I just keep trying and trying and hope that that weight will go on. Yes. A BMI over 24 is overweight. Over 30, and you're classed as obese. 
Caroline, what's your BMI to put you in the highest group then? Mm, 41. 41? Yes. And is this a problem that you've had with, with weight and things for some time? I have had it for as long as I can remember. I mean, I've always been big. Um, but at the end of the day, I feel happy inside, which is what counts, really. And do you find that, that your size inhibits you sexually with your partner, or is that not an issue for you two? No, because um, I'm an Anne Summers representative, so that kind oh, of helps. <laughs> and yeah. so do you take your work home with you, then? Um, absolutely. Every <laughs> single day. <laughs> That's been a boost to your sex life, has it, do yes. you think? Yes, yes. That in the bottom drawer. <laughs> and what's in the bottom drawer, then? No, you don't want to know. No, I'm not. <laughs> You're not going to tell me. Lots of things that take batteries. <laughs> <laughs> I lost the words there. <laughs> well, Caroline certainly isn't letting her high BMI get her down. But the hard truth for women who are overweight is that they're not helping their chances of conceiving. What's difficult is that some women seem to be able to be very overweight and quite happily get pregnant, and so all women think they can. But other women, it seems that the fat is producing quite a large amount of oestrogen, and that can actually cause problems on the fertile cycle. Weight can also be an issue for men. Men with poorer sperm quality are three times more likely to be obese. And also, obesity can have an effect on the ability of a man to get an erection. We've put the women through it by revealing their age and weight, so now it's the men's turn. Alan Pacey's team are just finishing the analysis of the men's sperm samples. Some of the couples have concerns about the results. That's not very good, no. He was an alcoholic for a lot of years. Um, he spent 20 years drinking very, very heavily. And it does concern me that maybe that's done him some damage over the time. You've yeah, smoked for so about 30 years, haven't you? Yeah, I have, yeah. Mm. So, it's a habit. He had a vasectomy reversal six months ago, and um, after the first sperm test he had, the, the numbers were very low. You're thinking, your partner's thinking, is he going to fire any live sperm at me today or not? And it's always at the back of your mind, you know. All our men have now been given their sperm counts. A normal count is anywhere between 20 and 50 million sperm per millilitre. Now, Gary, you're in a group that has the highest sperm count. In fact, you have the most phenomenally high sperm count amongst everybody here. All right. Your count is 406 million per All milliliter right. of your semen, which is about double the next highest person in the group. Oh, I see. Does that, <laughs> which is quite impressive, really. <laughs> That's a high sperm count. Does it, I right. mean, given your lifestyle, does that surprise you in what we've been talking about? Well, I suppose in a way it does, but I, I didn't know what to expect anyway, and it didn't particularly bother me, but it's just one of those things, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, I'm I mean, just lucky. <laughs> you are, yeah, that's right. I mean, of course, that's just measuring the number of the sperm, so the, the quantity rather than the quality. Certainly, you'd expect that all the habits that you have with the drinking and the yeah, past exactly. and, and the fags and stuff would have, would have knocked your sperm count on yeah. the head, really. But um, you've obviously got very strong genetics, and, uh -huh. uh, and obviously that's really helping. Genes are a key reason for individual differences in sperm count. But what happens in life matters too. There's also factors about how well he's been in his life, whether he's suffered any major illnesses or not, which can actually have quite an adverse effect on the function of the testicles, things like mumps, for example. And there's also factors about his lifestyle, sedentary jobs, being overweight, um, exposure to chemicals in the workplace. They can all contribute and have an additive effect and influence how many sperm he produces and how many ultimately get ejaculated. Chris, you're in the middle group, which uh, means that your sperm count's OK, but it's just slightly lower than the chaps over there. I've had a vasectomy reversal, and two weeks ago I only had 10 million sperm, and I'm absolutely amazed to be in this group. Paul, your sperm samples obviously put you on the lower end of the range. How do you feel about that? Um, I've got mixed feelings about that. Um, on the one hand, it's a bit of a blow to the ego. Um, but in some ways it's a relief because it means that we now know where there might be a problem with us, you know, with, with my wife trying to get pregnant. So how do you think she'll take the news? I think she'll be relieved actually, mm. uh, you know, because she thinks it's me that's got the problem, so obviously the weight's off her shoulders. But none of this group should be too depressed. Sperm counts can vary on a daily basis. Today's low results may be a one-off, as might the results in the higher count groups. It's almost time for our 100 couples to have their pregnancy test. Some will be pregnant, but how many and which ones? Pregnancy tests for me, um, 
is one of the worst times. I hate it. It's, it makes me feel really nervous. The last couple of times I've asked Rachel not to take them because they've always ended up being negative and that hurts a lot. It is nerve-wracking every time because you don't want to be disappointed. They're awful. <laughs> you know, those, those few minutes, you know, waiting for the lines or not to come up. I kind of put it in the bin and then go back to it about ten minutes later and think perhaps it's changed, perhaps it's changed, but it never has been. Fingers crossed, love. Yeah. <laughs> For couples trying to conceive, the pregnancy test is a monthly reminder that getting pregnant can be one of the most stressful things two people can go through together. Our 100 couples are waiting for news that could change their lives forever. It's time to find out which of you have succeeded in making a baby. You can now pop your pregnancy testers into your urine samples. In every 100 couples, on average, around 20 will manage to conceive in the first month. Jane and Simon have been targeting sex on the living room floor. Give it a quick bash on the old blow-up bed. No blue cross. Jane and Simon have to keep trying. Patsy and Michael have been doing their best to save Michael's sperm. After I ejaculate, I'd go down and um, <laughs> give Patsy oral sex to keep the sperm in. But it's a negative for them too. Sam and Chris have become sperm experts. Should we do a sample? Yeah, it's all right, darling. Go on then. It's also a negative. Another month and Sam's still not pregnant. It's also bad news for Paul and Juliet and Barbara and Andy. Paula and Gary both need to stop smoking, but Gary's past drinking doesn't seem to have affected his sperm count. Your count is double the next highest person in the group. Oh, I see. Does that <laughs> <laughs> Which is quite impressive. Okay. Oh. Don't know. That is a Paula and Gary are unsure, but after a few minutes, it all becomes clear. Oh my god! How does it feel now? Hey! hey. Uh. <laughs> Congratulations. I don't have to have sex anymore! Ah. <laughs> well done. Mum. They're not the only ones with good news. A total of 12 out of our 100 couples discover they are having a baby. <laughs> it's a Oh, congratulations. Thank you. For the others, the trying continues. And you realise how how important it is to you. Um, it's devastating. It's devastating news when we've been trying for sort of 12 months as well. So 12 couples pregnant today, and there's no need for the others to feel despondent either. Statistically, 85 couples will be pregnant within a year. And for them to help them on their way, here's our top five tips for making babies. It might be obvious, but to give yourself the best chance of conceiving, sex every two to three days is recommended. And remember, it's meant to be fun. Women should track their cycle, and sex two to three days before ovulation could be key. A woman's body mass index only needs to be 10% over or under the norm to affect her fertility. So try and get yours where it should be. You know this already, smoking is bad news all round. And guess what? If you're trying for a baby, it's even worse. Lastly, don't make it harder than it already is for those sperm. Lose the lubricants. The great news for our pregnant couples is that they don't have to worry about having sex on the right day of the month or the effect of masturbation, orgasms or oral sex anymore. For all our 100 couples, it's been an emotional start to the year. There's been good news and disappointment. We'll be following their stories as some carry on trying to conceive and others get used to being pregnant. 
The next nine months will bring their own life-changing moments. So it's waving. It's waving. <laughs> so we've woken it up. Our specialists will be travelling across the country, offering their expertise to the couples in our study. Testicular cancer is really interesting, and I can say this with a bit of personal insight in as much as I've had it as well. All right. I knew the risks, and because I run a sperm bank, that was one of the first things that I did. I ran down to the sperm bank and I banked some of my own sperm. We'll be bringing you more information about the factors which can affect baby making. So, no breakfast, coffee and a fag, followed by a bar of chocolate, mm -hmm. followed by nothing. But my body does feel like an old engine, you know, yeah, and I'm only 33. And of course, we'll be there for all the key moments over the coming year. It's just the most emotional thing that you could ever go through, ever. To see that you've just started to make a baby, it's just the most amazing thing ever. <laughs>